Hello, how are you guys this morning? I hope you're doing well. Today, Grandma wants to read you um, a little excerpt from this book, The Book of Virtues for Young People. And it's about the virtue of courage. I'm going to read you a little bit about what they say courage is, and then tell you, read you a story that is an example of someone who demonstrated courage. Courage, the most common misunderstanding about courage is the belief that courage means not feeling afraid. In truth, courage is not at all about emotions. It is not about how you feel. It is about how you act. Everybody is afraid of something. It's perfectly normal. You might be scared of being alone in a strange place or asking someone out on a date or saying the wrong thing and having people laugh at you. Feeling fear is an unavoidable part of life. The question is, what do you do when you have those fears? Do you run and hide or do you stand and face up to the situation? This is the essence of courage, mustering the strength and will to do what you know you should do, even though you are afraid. The great philosopher Aristotle put it this way, quote, we become brave by doing brave acts, quote. He meant that we may not feel very brave when we do something courageous. Nevertheless, by acting brave, by doing what is right and required, we turn ourselves into courageous people. It's the only way to overcome fear. So courage requires practice. One step at a time, little by little, you have to try facing your fears and acting the way you know you should act. And as you practice, some of your fears will go away. Here is a part of life where it makes sense to reach higher and higher. When you do, you'll find you have more courage than you thought. All right, now the example of a person who demonstrated courage is Rosa Parks. Maybe you'll recognize that name. When Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus, it led to one of the most important chapters in the story of civil rights in America. Parks' courage led to profound change for African Americans. It was Thursday, December 1st, 1955. The workday was over and crowds of people boarded the green and white buses that trundled through the streets of Montgomery, Alabama. Rosa Parks was tired after a full day of stitching and ironing shirts at the Montgomery Fair department store. She thought she was lucky to have gotten one of the last seats in the rear of the bus. Soon, the back of the bus was full and several people were standing in the rear. The bus rolled on through Court Square where African American, Americans had been auctioned off during the days of the Confederacy and came to a stop in front of the Empire Theater. The next passenger aboard stood in the front of an aisle. He was a white man. When he noticed that a white person had to stand, the bus driver, James F. Blake, called out to the four black people who were sitting just behind the white section. He said they would have to give up their seats for the new passenger. No one stood up. You'd better make it light on yourself and let me have those seats, the driver said threateningly. Three men got up and went to stand at the back of the bus. But Rosa Parks wasn't about to move. She had been in this situation before, and she had always given up her seat. She had always felt insulted by the experience. It meant that I didn't have the right to do anything but get on the bus, give them my fare, and that then be pushed around wherever they wanted me, she said. By a quirk of fate, the driver of the bus on this December evening 
was the same James F. Blake who had once before removed the troublesome Rosa Parks from his bus for refusing to enter by the back door. That was a long time ago in 1943. Rosa Parks didn't feel like being pushed around again. She told the driver she wasn't in the white section and she wasn't going to move. Blake knew the rules though. He knew that the white section was wherever the driver said it was. If more white passengers got on the bus, he could stretch the white section to the back of the bus and make all the blacks stand. He shouted to Rosa Parks to move to the back of the bus. She wasn't impressed. She told him again that she wasn't moving. Everyone on the bus was silent, wondering what would happen next. Finally, Blake told Rosa Parks that he would have her arrested for violating the racial segregation codes. In a firm but quiet voice, she told him that he could do what he wanted, but she wasn't moving. Blake got off the bus and came back with an officer of the Montgomery Police Department. As the officer placed Rosa Parks under arrest, she asked him plainly, why do you people push us around? With the eyes of all the passengers on him, the officer could only answer in confusion. I don't know. I'm just obeying the law. Rosa Parks was taken to the police station where she was booked and fingerprinted. While the policemen were filling out forms, she asked if she could have a drink of water. She was told that the drinking fountain in the station was for whites only. Then a policewoman marched her down a long corridor facing walls of iron bars. A barred door slid open, she went inside. The door clanged shut and she was locked in. She was in jail. Rosa Parks' decision to challenge her arrest in court led Montgomery's black community to organize a bus boycott as a show of support. So she was fighting her arrest. Rosa Parks woke up on the morning of Monday, December 5th, thinking about her trial. As she and her husband got out of bed, they heard the familiar sound of the city bus line pulling up to a stop across the road. There was usually a crowd of people waiting for the bus at this time. The parks rushed to the window and looked out. Except for the driver, the bus was empty. There was no one getting on it either. The bus stood at the stop for more than a minute, puffing exhaust smoke into the cold December air as the puzzled driver waited for passengers. But no one appeared and the bus drove away empty. Rosa Parks was filled with happiness. Her neighbors were actually boycotting the buses. She couldn't wait to drive to the courthouse so that she could see how the boycott was going in the rest of Montgomery. When Fred Gray arrived to drive her to the trial, she wasn't disappointed. Rosa Parks had expected some people to stay off the buses. She thought that with luck, maybe even half, the usual passengers would stay off. But these buses were just plain empty. All over the city, empty buses bounced around for everyone to see. There was never more than the usual small group of white passengers in front, and sometimes a lonely back, black passenger in back, wondering what was going on. The streets were filled with black people walking to work. As Rosa Parks and her lawyer drove up to the courthouse, there was another surprise waiting for them. A crowd of about 500 blacks had gathered to show their support for her. Mrs. Parks and the lawyer made their way slowly through the cheering crowd into the courtroom. Once they were inside, the trial didn't take long. Rosa Parks was quickly convicted of breaking the bus segregation laws and fined $10 as well as $4 for the cost of her trial. 
This was the stage at which Claudette Colvin's trial had ended seven months earlier. Colvin had had little choice but to accept the guilty verdict and pay the fine. This time, however, Fred Gray, her lawyer, rose to file an appeal on Rosa Parks' case. This meant that her case would be taken to a higher court at a later date. Meanwhile, Mrs. Parks was free to go. Outside the courthouse, the crowd was getting restless. Some of them were carrying sawed off shotguns and the policemen were beginning to look worried. E.D. Nixon went out to calm them, but nobody could hear him in the din. Voices from the crowd shouted out that they would storm the courthouse if Rosa Parks didn't come out safely within a few minutes. When she did appear, a great cheer went up again. After seeing the empty buses that morning and this large and fearless crowd around her now, Rosa Parks knew she had made the right decision. Black people were uniting to show the city administration that they were tired of the insult of segregation. Together, they could change Montgomery. They could do some good. Rosa Parks showed courage and stood up for what was right. And she was able to help change the laws that segregated the black people that were not fair and were not right. I hope that we can have courage and practice doing what's right, even if we might be a little bit scared to do it. Let us choose the right. Remember, grandma loves you. Talk to you later.